Hi, I did a recent video on Munson, which I'll uh, link in down below and at the end of this video if you haven't seen it, and that's the process of, in the particular case of the video I did, removing bypass capacitors from a circuit to see if it still worked. I removed them one by one, and ultimately, yes, the circuit did still work, but it really, it was just for fun. It wasn't really a demonstration that you shouldn't use bypass capacitors in your circuit because I've done which I'll link in up here it'll be a YouTube card up here to a very popular uh, 30 minute whiteboard uh, tutorial on what are bypass capacitors, how they work, why you use different values of bypass capacitors in certain situations. Then I also uh, do some practical demonstrations using a poor man's network analyzer to see the frequency response of that. But I thought uh, we'd follow on from this, or really part two of the more technical tutorial side of things of why you want to use bypass capacitors and why you actually want to put them right near the components and loop area which I've talked about in the previous months in video and many other uh, videos as well. So I thought uh, we'd do a practical demonstration rather than the uh, network uh, analyzer one before with frequency responses and all that sort of thing. Actually get some bypass capacitors and actually put them in different places in a circuit and actually see the effect they have. Not only high frequency bypass capacitors, but uh, lower uh, frequency bulk supply decoupling uh, capacitors as well. So let's get into it. Now, a practical demonstration of bypass capacitors is really uh, quite difficult to do on a regular, uh, like, complex proper product uh, PCB. It's much easier to do if you actually set up and experiment for it. So what I've got here is a just a single-sided uh, copper clad PCB. I haven't done anything to it. I could have you know, used a double-sided board, routed out and things like that, but it's much easier. I just used some uh, copper tape here to simulate uh, traces and have one big ground plane on the bottom. So we're talking about transmission lines here, but we'll also talk about our loop area, and it just allows us to put the bypass capacitors in uh, different locations along here and see um, how it makes a difference. 5 volts uh, DC coming in here, uh, the green is the ground, that just goes to the uh, big copper ground plane there, and the uh, plus 5 volts goes to this copper tape, which goes all the way up here to the top pin of a 1 megahertz crystal oscillator. This is a standard crystal oscillator you should be familiar with here. This pin is uh, soldered directly down to the ground pin. That's ground pin. The positive pin is soldered directly onto that input uh, tape here. This is uh, just a not connected pin and the output is connected to this copper tape up here. And as I've uh, shown in the previous video, I won't go over it again, but I'm using a proper um, low inductance uh, probing solution here with my one gig bandwidth uh, Tektronix probes, you might be able to see that. I've just got a tiny little loop of wire in there so that I can actually connect my probe directly into there. So we're going to have, and the ground is a very short ground, uh, using the little probe wire attachment here. Very important if you want to get the best signal uh, integrity possible, which is what we want to do here, and that's connected directly to the ground plane. So we're getting an excellent um, high signal integrity probing solution. And then the output from that goes along this uh, copper tape, which is five millimeters wide, and it's actually around about 1.6 millimeters thickness, so standard PCB, and that gives roughly 50 ohms uh, impedance, and we've got that terminated in two 100 ohm resistors in parallel. So it's terminated in 50 ohms, and then we've got the same low inductance uh, probing solution there as well. So the entire point of bypass capacitors, of course, is for digital uh, systems which switch from zero to five volts, which we can see up here on the screen. Uh, here's the output of the oscillator on channel one here, zero to five volts. It's only one megahertz. The frequency actually doesn't matter. What we worry about is the uh, transition time here, and it's reasonably fast. It's a HCMOS uh, oscillator. So we've got like two nanoseconds uh, fall time, and the rise time is going to be similar there. So we just want something with a fast edge so that we can see the uh, transitions on the power supply. So we've, what we've got is a basic circuit here, which you can imagine is a product PCB which you would design. You'd have your power input here, it'd go along some uh, power traces to your digital uh, chip, which you're particularly interested in. In this case, we've only got one, but it might be multiple chips in multiple systems. And then it drives an output load. In this case, it's driving a 50 ohm transmission line, 50 ohm load. So we need that to actually get a decent 
uh, pulse currents, um, in this case, five volts on uh, 50 ohms, so that we can actually get some large current transitions in the signal trace and more importantly, uh, flowing through the ground plane so that we can actually see the effect of bypass capacitors because bypass capacitors matter more for things that take large amounts of current when they're transitioning. And it doesn't have to be a resistive load either. This trace down here will also have capacitance. And if this was dry, if this was just a regular signal wire driving another, you know, CMOS TTL digital gate over here, that digital gate's got input capacitance, the trace has input capacitance to ground. And when, when your signal transitions like this, you remember capacitive impedance uh, formula that it actually acts for a brief period of time acts as a low impedance or you know, effectively, if, if it's an infinite transition time like that, it's effectively the capacitor operates as a short circuit. So even if you have no resistive loads, unlike what we've uh, got in this circuit, if you've just got traces and capacitive uh, input gates, all input gates have capacitance, even if it is only a couple of picofarads, couple of puff, every time you transition in your circuit, it takes a little gulp of current from your power supply. And that's what bypass capacitors are designed to help with. So I'll briefly go over bypass capacitors again, but you really have to watch my 30-minute uh, tutorial video to really understand what's happening there. So I recommend you watch that uh, first. This is more a practical demonstration, but you have basically uh, two different types of bypass capacitors in a circuit. You have your bulk power supply capacitance, which generally goes um, right at the power supply input or at the output of a voltage regulator, whatever it is. Um, and generally that will serve all the chips on the board. So it basically stores charge and delivers it for the lower frequency uh, type events in your uh, circuit, like, you know, the 50, 100 hertz mains input ripple, for example, on a traditional uh, linear AC uh, bridge rectified power supply, for example, it'd smooth that out. Whereas um, bypass capacitors like 100 nanofarads or 0.1 microfarads that you typically put right next to each IC, just as sort of like an industry rule of thumb, these store charge, which actually provide the energy for the higher frequency switching transitions which we get in here. So what we're going to take a look at here is we've got some low frequency stuff happening here and we've also got some high frequency stuff happening in here. So we'll be able to uh, use the different bypass capacitors and we'll see how these handle the different types of uh, scenarios. So let's get to it. So we've got absolutely no bypass capacitance on this circuit at the moment. It's just switching at one megahertz with those fast transitions. It's not recommended. Don't not have any bypass capacitors in your design. And channel one here at the yellow waveform, as I said, is the output of the oscillator down here and that's the one we're triggering off. Whereas channel two, the blue one here, is actually the power supply pin directly on this chip. Because when you're looking at bypassing, you're concerned about, in this particular case, concerned about the actual component which is in this case transmitting, or it could be uh, the receiver uh, chip over here, for example, that's actually receiving the signal or both of them. Anyway, we're concerned with that power supply rail. How stable is that rail relative to the uh, switching currents that this thing is taking? In this case, every time the output goes higher like this, it's got to drive that to 50 ohm load. So we get, it's basically drawing a big gulp of current like that. So if you have a look here, we've actually got uh, 200 millivolts per division here for the power supply. And that's a lot. Look, we've got maybe like 300 millivolts peak to peak of this low frequency ripple, we'll call it, even though it's like one megahertz like that. Okay, it is still, in this particular case, the lower frequency uh, switching stuff. And that's quite a lot. To have your 5 volt rail vary by, uh, you know, 300 millivolts peak to peak, that's a, that's a lot of a ripple on your power supply. That's horrible. That's because we've got no bypass capacitors on there. And in this case, it's actually taken due to various uh, parasitics uh, in the circuit because we've got no capacitance whatsoever. It's actually uh, taken what turns into a, what looks like a sinusoidal uh, waveform here. And also you can see the droop in there. And if we actually change the scale 
on our channel two here, and we move that up, we can see that that power supply corresponds directly with the droop in the output uh, waveform. So that's due to no capacitance and various uh, parasitic uh, capacitances and other things in the circuit, which we won't particularly worry about. And if we zoom right in at 100 millivolts uh, per division on our power supply, this is the high frequency ripple there that uh, we want to get rid of with our uh, 0.1 microfarad high frequency bypass capacitor near the chip. And it's the worst on the negative transition here, so we'll concentrate on that. So let's look at the effect of a 330 microfarad uh, cap, a bulk decoupling capacitor on the circuit. So I'll put it down here right at the input where you'd normally have it. So we expect this to affect the low frequency ripple stuff. Get the polarity correct. And bingo! Look at that, it goes away. Magic, that's the effect of bulk. Look, there's virtually none of that ripple and crap that we saw before. Yeah, there's high frequency noise there, but that's not the job of this capacitor. So it's doing an excellent job there of getting rid of that low frequency stuff. That's what your bulk decoupling's for. But check it out, even though our low frequency stuff has gone, our high frequency stuff is still in there, it doesn't get rid of that. But aha, uh -huh, let's put this near the chip up here, which is a good design practice, and see what happens. Here we go, I'll put it directly on the probe and directly on the pin and the ground plane of this chip. It doesn't get any better. There we go. It reduced it a little bit. It has some effect, of course, because it is working as a high frequency bypass capacitor. But this electrolytic, due to its various uh, uh, parasitic inductances and whatnot inside, and the ESR inside this thing, it's just not good enough as a high frequency bypass capacitor. It's really only good for bulk decoupling. Watch my previous video to see what's actually happening inside this capacitor. But let's do exactly the same thing with the 100 nanofarad uh, film capacitor, which they work uh, quite well as um, bypass capacitors. So let's whack it in here in exactly the same location as before. That one is a bit more effective. But let's try your more traditional uh, ceramic capacitor like this. There we go. That one's done a reasonable job, but not much better than the film cap, really. Probably about the same. Let's show the effect of that bypass capacitance again. The point one, notice the sp height of the uh, spikes up there, they're just off uh, screen there. But if you lower that down, look, it gets rid of those effectively, but the point one microfarads on its own is not enough to get rid of the uh, lo lower frequency ripple inside there. You need both capacitors in this particular case. So I'll clean that up again. Here's the power supply ripple without the cap and with the cap. There you go. You can see there's still a bit of high frequency stuff in there. That's going to have to do with the uh, type of cap and the uh, inductance of the leads and other uh, traces and, you know, parasitics like that. But you can see that it got rid of a good bunch of that um, high frequency switching stuff. The reason why this little 0.1 microfarad one doesn't get rid of the low frequency stuff and the big 330 mic does is because this can store a lot more charge so it can deliver that charge to smooth out that high current stuff that we've got in there. If we didn't have a very low impedance load like we've got here and it wasn't uh, drawing much current, then we wouldn't actually get that low frequency stuff. And I can show you that by lifting the legs of those resistors there and all we get is the high frequency uh, switching. So that's what would happen in a circuit if you were just driving another digital gate that uh, just had uh, switching capacitance. It's just because it's driving a capacitive line, it's actually, uh, or and or a transmission line in this case, but effectively every trace is a transmission line, but we won't get into that. Um, that's what's causing this ring in here because there's not sufficient bypass. So that, um, once again, we're on 100 millivolts per division. That's an awful lot of ripple happening on your 5 volt power supply. It's horrible. It's got all sorts of ramifications in terms of uh, signal integrity, glitches in your circuit, transitions and ground bounce and all sorts of, you know, weird and wonderful stuff which we won't get into. But if we connect the load, B 
Bingo, we've got that uh, lower frequency uh, switch in Ripple as well due to the high pulse currents actually, or high uh, transmission driving currents going into that load. Now, watch the size of these high frequency uh, switching transitions on the power supply rail as we move our bypass capacitor closer and further away from our device being decoupled and probed. So if I put it fairly close up there, look at that. There's, there's our signal level. You can see where they are. And if, so as I slide it towards there, hopefully you'll be able to see that. There you go. As we get closer and closer to the chip, it lowers in amplitude. And if we get as close as we possibly can, bingo, that's as low as we can get with this particular um, bypass capacitor because it's got the particular type and the uh, leads on there. Remember, leads like this always have inductance. That's why surface mount bypass capacitors close to the chip are going to be better than through hole ones. Whereas the bulk decoupling capacitor, it's not going to matter where on there we actually uh, put it. It's going to do the same job up the top as it does down the bottom. Because it's uh, due to the higher frequencies, it doesn't matter about the lead length or the trace length here. But there is a limit to that. If we actually uh, go and put this, I, I'll even use a bigger one. I'll use a 2200 microfarad one. If I put that here, it's going to do exactly the same thing. It's going to get rid of that ripple. But if we go put it right over here, there is a limit to the effectiveness of this thing. There you go. It changed it a little bit but really doesn't do a huge amount because we've got all the extra inductance of the leads here and everything else and it's closer to the uh, lower impedance source over here. So it's got to be placed reasonably close to the low impedance ground over here. It can't be at the other end of the cable right over here. It's not nearly as effective. And by the way, we don't need 330 microfarads to get rid of that either. We can use, a, in this case, a half a microfarad here, um, another film cap, and we can put that there. And it's going to do a quite respectable job of getting rid of that as well. You can still see there's a little bit of low frequency stuff in there, but not much. So, you know... Even that does a reasonable job. You don't need to overdo it on your bulk decoupling capacitor. It all depends on the amount of uh, bulk current actually being taken in your circuit and at what frequency. So let's now try the best possible bypass that we can get for this particular scenario, which is a uh, basically a leadless, um, and that's what they are, a leadless capacitor, surface mount capacitor, um, 1206 soldered directly to the ground plane and the pin. Let's give that a burl. That's probably the best we can do. It's still got to go through the ground plane. It's still got to go up the lead into the package, and the ground lead on the other side is uh, quite tall on the package. But anyway... This should be the lowest amount of high frequency switching uh, noise that we get. Check it out. That's absolutely amazing. Look at that. We've got not much there at all. You remember what we had last time we had, it was maybe the same height there, but there was some more undershoot there. That is really good. So that's obvious, you know, you could eventually get rid of most of it, you can't really eliminate it entirely because uh, ultimately there are going to be uh, package limitations, even surface mount, even leadless surface mount packages like those capacitors, they've still got some inductance in them. The ground plane still has some inductance. The bond wire, if you're using a surface mount chip, the lead of the uh, chip has some inductance in it, as tiny as it is, and then the bond wire going over into the chip internally, that's got some inductance in it, et cetera, et cetera. And, it's, and also the probing solution's got a little bit there. So a little bit here, a little bit there, but that's still pretty good for that sort of uh, leaded package there. I like it. So if we combine that with our bulk decoupling here, we've gotten rid of almost all of our switching stuff. Nice. So I know what you're thinking, Dave, what if we actually change the value of the capacitor? Does that make a difference in the high frequency content? If you use a lower value cap, will that do it? Because I mentioned in a previous video why you want to use, or you, know, you might want to use different value capacitors in parallel um, for different uh, frequency components. Well, let's try our uh, 0.1 microfarad one again. There we go, reduces it like that. Okay, in this case, I've got the uh, white reference waveform there. I've stored the 100 nanofarad cap, and now we'll put in the 2.2 2 
nanofarad cap in exactly the same location. As you can see, there are some differences there, but basically it's it's not really going to change the peak. The peak, um, which is around about there, is basically the same with both of them, but the 100N uh, had more undershoot like that, whereas if uh, you put both of them there, you should be able to combine them. So that, you know, having the two bypass capacitors on there can make a difference. Different values, 100 nanofarads and 2.2N. That's the combination because the smaller capacitor, the 2.2 nanofarad, will take care of some of the more higher frequency components, but it all interacts, as I explained in the previous video, with the lead inductance, like all the package inductance and the parasitics in the circuit and everything else. So what do we talk about when we talk about loop area in terms of uh, current flowing like a complete path like this? Well, we have our power supply input over here. We have our driving chip, we have our load, and we have our return ground path. So let's assume that we have our bulk decoupling capacitor uh, right at the input here. Well, when you talk about, uh, in this case, um, switching currents and the high frequency is involved, um, and this is how transmission lines work. Well, currents in a circuit will always take the lowest impedance or lowest resistance path uh, from the source through the circuit and then back to the ground terminal like this. So if we have our bulk decoupling capacitor over here, for example, then our current will flow up here into our chip. It'll flow along here like this, and then it will actually return from this ground point here, and it'll take the lowest impedance or lowest resistance path. And for low frequency stuff, lowest DC resistance path will basically be straight through there. I know it, it distributes through the PCB and everything like that, but it's basically going to take a direct path. So all that right around there, that is our loop area, and that's where the current uh, has to flow. And here's the trick. The larger the loop area, the larger the physical distance and uh, circle like that, and the higher frequency you go, the more it's going to act like an antenna and it's going to radiate electromagnetic or EMI, electromagnetic uh, interference. It's going to just generate all that. And your uh, device may not pass your CE FCC compliance, which I've done a separate video on. So you always want to minimize this loop area. Now for low frequency bulk decoupling, it doesn't matter. That's why it doesn't matter where you put it. Um, effectively, it still works even if you put it right over here to the input. And effectively, that's where in a ground plane, that's where it's going to flow start and end at. So that's okay. But high frequency stuff, eh, it's a different ball game. For high frequency stuff, we've shown that the bypass capacitor is more effective over here, um, right on the chip itself. So effectively, this capacitor becomes the source for all those high frequency transitions we've seen. And it'll do the same thing. It'll flow out the, your high frequency currents will flow out here like this, but your return path won't be back over to your large uh, decoupling capacitor over here because it's a lower impedance at that higher frequency to actually travel under the, I've shown it sort of like next to the transmission line, but it's actually under the transmission line. And you can prove this, you know, mathematically in field equations, you know, all sorts of uh, weird and wonderful uh, advanced theory to uh, show that this is the case. But the current will actually flow back under that transmission line. So that becomes your loop area. So here's where good high frequency design comes in uh, and why you put your high frequency bypass capacitor right next to the chip because you're minimizing that loop area for generating electromagnetic um, interference. If you put this bypass capacitor well away from the chip over here, then it has no choice but to follow that as the lower impedance ground. And if you do that, bingo, you've got this large area again at high frequencies. And when you have that large loop area, wah, 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 you're probably going to be uh, starting to fail your EMC compliance. This thing's going to be radiating to buggery. And it can also pick up things as well, the larger the loop area. 
Now I'd love to actually uh, show you that on the board and I actually um, was hoping that I'd be able to actually show you the current and the mapping flowing through uh, the board under here like this using my um, AIM iProber 520 cu uh, positional current probe which has a magnetic uh, head on it but really you can't pick up the currents. If you put it on here, there we go, directly on the trace, you can actually see the switching uh, currents in the trace, but unfortunately it's down in the noise floor for the actual uh, current path, but all is not lost yet. Look at this. If I take my bypass capacitor and put it over here, or anywhere, and probe right on the leg, look at that, bingo! You can see that all that current is flowing through the lead of that poor little bypass capacitor. So all that, so that shows that it has to be flowing across the ground plane like this and all the way back to that cap. So the closer we put it over here, then the smaller the loop area we're going to get. Now, unfortunately, this doesn't have the bandwidth to really show the detail in the high frequency uh, switching stuff, which we've uh, been used to. But as I showed in the Munson video, there's an IBM research paper, which I'll link down below, where they've actually uh, visually mapped the uh, currents in the ground planes like this. And uh, you can check that in, link down below, but here's a, a screenshot of that. And it's very cool. Unfortunately, we don't have the tools to do that. So it really does matter where you put your bypass capacitor in the circuit and why it should be near the chip, but there's a whole lot more involved in this. It's not always as simple as that, but that's why it's a good, like, you know, rule of thumb just to, you know, have a bypass capacitor. Um, its value is not that critical in most cases next to um, each or, you know, nearby uh, groups of chips in your particular uh, digital layout. But that can vary depending on whether you've got a full ground plane like this one, or whether you're not, you've got a double-sided board and it's all filled in and higgledy-pickledy and grounds running everywhere. That's a different uh, kettle of fish, and I hope to show that better in a uh, follow-up video to this. I hope it works. All right, so what we're gonna do now is take a very crude and quick look at uh, what this thing is radiating. I have got my how you doing antenna hooked up to here. Yes, it is a piece of solder, no worries. I've got my Rigol uh, Spectrum Analyzer here. Got a 500 megahertz span on here. I got it switched off. So that is like our baseline at minus uh, 77 dBm there. Don't worry about the setup. This is not, you know, an absolute um, first class type measurement system. We just want to see if we can see a difference by putting the bypass capacitors on here. Okay, that's our baseline around minus 77 dBm. Okay, it's just come on. This sweep here will show us our spectrum. There we go. Pretty filthy. Look at this. Uh, so this is 100 megahertz, 50 uh, megahertz per division. Um, so at around about like 125 megahertz, there's a big broadband content in there. At around about what, uh, 230 megahertz or something, we've got a uh, some content in there and some higher up uh, stuff there. So that's with no bypassing at all. All right, now I'm going to put on the 100 microfarad bulk decoupling cap. We're still going to get a lot of that high frequency content. It's changed it a little bit. Look, we've still got some uh, content here at uh, 250 odd megahertz. And we've still got all this uh, broadband content down there around the 100 megahertz mark. Now let's just put out on our 0.1 microfarad bypass cap. We've got to wait for the cycle to start again. Here it goes. And bingo, quite, well, no, our content around there has uh, narrowed, but we still have some content up at 250 megahertz. Why is it so? Well, let's take a look at the scope screen. It'll tell us. All right, this is with our 0.1 microfarad bypass cap. If you have a look, we're at two nanoseconds per division. What is uh, the period there? Well, it's about four nanoseconds. What's that? Eh, it's around about that 250 megahertz mark that we saw. So that uh, small amount of content there at the 250 megahertz mark is going to be due to that uh, high frequency stuff there. And if we put both bypass caps on there, 
it's going to be not nearly as high around that 250. We've basically neutered that out now. But you can see how if we remove the bypass caps, it's actually shifted frequency somewhat because the parasitics are all different in there. So it's going to uh, ring at a different uh, frequency. So that also can cause a problem if you try and mix your bypass capacitors, I've explained this in the previous video, and um, due to the parasitics inside these capacitors and the parasitics in the trace and the lead lengths and everything else, um, you could potentially get these to resonate at a frequency that you don't want them to resonate at. So it's not always, you know, 100% guaranteed the best idea to put multiple caps in parallel or even choosing the wrong value bypass cap could choose, could form a resonant tank circuit at a particular frequency and you could end up getting a spike on your spectrum. And well, that comes down to Murphy. Usually happens on a Friday afternoon. So let's go for broke and put on our bulk decoupling cap here and our two smaller ones, reasonably close, there we go. And let's see how this spectrum changes. We've got to wait for it, see how it just knocks it all down at the, uh, between like, uh, you know, 200 megahertz and 500 megahertz. You can see how it's changed drastically by adding those bypass caps in. If I take them off, boom, the crap starts coming back. So all this horrible broadband content here and here is caused by all this ringing in here. Look at it, this is just, just horrible. And the amplitude is, you know, <laughs> incredibly high. So it's, it's just radiating like buggery. And well, that kind of stuff, yeah, you're probably not gonna pass your uh, CE, FCC uh, emissions compliance. So I've put that uh, 1206 ceramic uh, capacitor back and you can see that our um, high frequency uh, switching noise there is like bugger all really, um, but we're still getting this content right up here at like 125 odd megahertz, but yeah, everything else is reasonably low and that's with our hundred, um, that's with our bulk uh, decoupling cap on there. If we remove the bulk decoupling cap, meh, it doesn't really affect any of the, uh, that bulk high frequency content at 125. And if we switch it off, of course, you can see that it all buggers off. So um, all that content is being radiated by our uh, circuit under test. And of course, we've got the one megahertz uh, fundamental oscillator as well um, spewing out the stuff. So it's not just the uh, high frequency ringing on there, but you could definitely correlate the high frequency ringing to uh, that... Uh, what was it, you know, 250 odd megahertz uh, peak on there. And all this stuff matters. I mean, it's, you know, these maximum peaks matter when you're testing um, EMC compliance. And if we have a look at our one megahertz fundamental here on a 10 megahertz uh, span, so we're one megahertz uh, per division there, there's our fundamental at one megahertz, then the harmonic at three megahertz, five, seven, nine, and so forth. So I hope you enjoyed that video. It was a bit longer than I expected, but uh, hopefully it shows the difference between bulk decoupling capacitors and the higher frequency ones and having multiple ones in parallel in terms of not only uh, signal fidelity over here, but also in terms of loop area and how that actually uh, generates electromagnetic interference. So hope you enjoyed that. If you did, please give it a big thumbs up. And as always, discuss down below and uh, the other videos will be linked in at the end, somewhere here. Catch you next time.